Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as um, you are aware that um, I'll be talking uh, you through to the role of informed consent in ethical data collection, sharing, and reuse. Um, it, it will be especially in the context of data sharing uh, for future reuse, but we'll, we'll go through these uh, in a minute. My name is Hina and I work as a senior research data officer within the research data management team at UK Data Archive based at University of Essex. And my colleague Gail is here with us too to keep an eye on the technical side of um, this uh, session will include presentation and as I said, slides will be provided on, after the event on our event page. There will be activities on the Mentimeter. I will uh, show you the Mentimeter code uh, when it comes and uh, there is a Padlet for an activity as well, which will be, uh, I think Gail will add the link to the Padlet at the end. And as I said, there is a Padlet for the questions um, you can scan this QR code from the uh, camera of your mobile and um, uh, Gail will add the link uh, in the chat as well for the Q&A. You are welcome to add the questions on the Padlet and I will answer those questions after the workshop. So the overall aim of this session is to show you the role of informed consent in sharing data within ethical and legal boundaries. And I aim to cover the following in this session. Um, in the first section, I'll talk you through why to seek consent. And this section will focus on introducing the use of informed consent in research. And the second part of the session is about how con consent can be obtained. Um, covering documentation methods that are used to obtain consent, and finally, how to manage the uh, consent forms. This is then followed by a section on when consent could be sought during the research process, and some of the important aspects that needs to be considered are also discussed. And um, Final section focuses on sharing with you some of the wordings used in real consent forms by the researchers and example consent form wordings um, and the template uh, we uh, advise to use the UKDS uh, consent form te template and uh, information sheet and I'll finish it off by um, highlighting some best practice tips and resources that can be very useful for you if you are interested in data sharing. And as I said, we'll respond to the questions in the end. So this uh, first section is about why we seek consent. Before I begin that, if you could please go to menti.com. This is the code, or you can scan the QR code Thank you very much. So just a general question. Um, what is the one thing you hope to learn or further develop by the end of this workshop? This will help me uh, adding or updating content for our future workshop because we do run these workshops twice a year. So that, that would be very helpful if there is anything you would like to share best protocols and policies and data sharing, yes. How to best advise our researchers, that's, that's right. Good practice for generating consent, wording to ensure we cover ourselves for transparent future use of data. I hope I will cover that today. And the there are many things you have mentioned here, and if there is anything missing, I'll go through this later on and I'll update my slides for the next session in spring. So thank you very much. Knowing how to ensure patients are properly informed, understand how to execute proper practices of ethical data collection and sharing concerning vulnerable populations. Yeah, I, I would say that um, it's not very uh, context specific. It's just an introductory workshop. Um, so yeah, I, I, I will keep these in mind. 
So social media for data collection, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, so there, there, there are lots of um, suggestions or what you, are your expectations uh, for from this workshop. So hopefully I will cover some of these and if there is anything missing, as I said, I will update the slides and uh, for ready for our uh, spring session. Thank you very much. So there are still some responses coming up. Future trends in data ethics. Yeah, AI is one of them. And I'm also looking to get some training myself for AI. So that's a new trend. Yeah, thank you very much. So the next question is just a simple one. I'm sure every one of you are aware why we seek consent in research. Any thoughts on that? To ensure the safety of participants, that's right. Ethical research to, for ethical frameworks, ethics, protection of participants, active participation, yeah, ethical concerns, to comply with the law, yes, that's, that's right. Um, to protect research participants' privacy, integrity, safety, to avoid any ethical issues, legal basis, yes, to adhere or best practice, risk of harm, to avoid it, exactly. Fantastic. For using a data in our public research, it gets better data, GDPR, being able to publish, exactly. That's, that's brilliant. In order to share valuable data while protecting participants, yes. And for, uh, there is a comment that to protect participants and researchers. So both understand what the purpose of collecting data is, what it will be used. Exactly, it's, it's for both of them, for the researchers as well. Yeah, for research quality, validating the research to address common law. Exactly, thank you very much, brilliant, that's fantastic. Uh, let's get back, yeah. You, um, I must say that you all are very familiar with what informed consent is. And as uh, all of you have mentioned that um, it, it it is the process, gaining obtained consent uh, is a process by which a researcher discloses appropriate information about the research so that a participant may make a um, voluntary informed choice to accept or to refuse to participate in the research. And um, in the research context, uh, consent is obtained to ensure that participants understand what they are signing up to making participation and research more effective. And it also ensures that the research conducted is ethical and compliant with the data protection regulation, as um, all of you have mentioned. So briefly speaking, uh, so in research context, we need consent for two purposes. Consent for research participation, which is considered as one of the founding principles of research ethics, uh, where we obtained it before participation in any research activity and for all participants, um, it, it is usually obtained and uh, it involves providing information regarding study purposes, risk, benefit, voluntary participation, and so on. However, consent can also be used to comply with the data protection regulation. If a researcher collects, manages, and share personal data, then consent of the data subject can be used as a legal basis to process this personal information under the UK GDPR. So <clears throat> there, there are... Um, two main legal frameworks that relates to identified or identifiable individuals, the common law or duty of confidentiality and data protection legislation. I have gone through these uh, in my 
last workshop, which you can uh, view on the YouTube on our YouTube channel. But just briefly, I'll go through each of these um, for now. Um, in the UK, there is a duty of confidentiality that is based in common law and that occurs where confidential information comes to the knowledge of a person in circumstances where it would be unfair if it were then to be disclosed to others. However, there are some exceptions when you can disclose information, for example, if participant consents to onward sharing of their personal data, then sharing does not breach duty of confidentiality and sometimes public interest can override duty of confidentiality. So occasionally there are instances when you may have to give up data such as upon a court order. And um, uh, so for the consent form, it is the best practice uh, that you avoid any sort of specific promises in consent forms. And um, as um, researchers, we must adhere to data protection requirements when managing or sharing personal data. Um, you, you must be aware what personal data is, but um, it is any information relating to identified or identifiable natural person and um, people can be identified directly or indirectly. Um, some of the examples of direct identifiers are name, address, postcode, telephone number, voice, picture, and uh, indirect identifiers could be occupation, geography, or um, any unique or exceptional outliers in the data. So if personal information about people is collected or used in research, then the G GDPR applies, UK GDPR. A bit of background to the GDPR is necessary here. Um, GDPR is the EU-wide data protection regulation that was introduced in 2018, and it replaces uh, replaced UK Data Protection Act that was used until that time. So after Brexit, it is now called the UK GDPR. And um, it will therefore be important for researchers to ensure that they gain local support from their university data protection officer uh, when their research project will span across the EU. So if the researcher based in the UK collects personal data about people anywhere in the world or a researcher outside the UK collects personal data on UK citizen, citizens, then um, DPA and UK GDPR both applies. And um, if any researchers are undertaking research projects which span across EU, then the EU GDPR also applies. So this is something you need to keep in mind. So there, there is a misconception that data protection laws such as uh, UK GDPR prohibits data sharing. However, it does not prevent data sharing as long as you approach it in a sensible and uh, proportionate way. So in fact, it is useful for research because it legalizes much of the current good practice in research such as data sharing and archiving so other people can reuse the data. So. Under the UK GDPR, there are six possible grounds for processing personal data and one of these should be present. So these grounds are consent, public interest, legitimate interest, protect vital interest, legal obligation, performance of a contract. I have gone through these uh, in the ethical and um, legal considerations in data sharing workshop, uh, I think last week. Uh, so you, you can check that workshop if you are interested in, in, in detail about these uh, lawful bases. The video should be on the YouTube channel. So um, here in the UK, consent is rarely used as a legal ground. Um, ICO advises um, public tasks 
to be used as a lawful base to process personal data in the UK by all public bodies such as the universities or uh, research organizations. But if you are using it as a legal or lawful basis, uh, then you need to make sure that you fulfill certain conditions associated to it. I'm, I'm referring to the consent as a lawful base here. So, for example, it must, if you are using consent as a lawful base, then uh, it must be freely given, it should be informed, it should be unambiguous, it should be granular, such as if it is for audio recording, it is it for video and so on, and it must be a clear affirmative action and cannot be inferred from silence, pre tick boxes, or inactivity and make sure that the participants were given the opportunity to request to remove their personal data at any time. This request to withdraw is uh, for removing their data and not from a withdrawal from research, which is ordinarily asked in the consent forms. Because participants, um, they do have a right to withdraw or ask to remove the, their data um, under the UK GDPR. And also, it uh, the uh, consent must be documented. That is recorded, written, or oral, um, but it should be documented. And finally, an explicit consent is required to process special categories data, which is uh, race, ethnic origin, politics, religion, genetics, or health data. In that case, you do need to obtain explicit explicit consent. So, uh, as I mentioned that um, if you are processing special category data, then obtaining explicit consent could be mandatory. It depends. And if you process special category data or confidential information under con common law or duty of confidentiality, so I thought to add a little bit of uh, information on explicit consent as well. Um, in case you are interested. So, uh, ordinary consent can be obtained verbally or in writing. However, explicit consent should always be recorded or documented. And there are certain conditions that need to be adhered to, otherwise the consent can become invalid. For example, in case there is no genuine free choice was given, or if there was a clear imbalance of power between a researcher and the individual, it becomes invalid if the consent request was vague or unclear. So make sure that um, the consent form statements are clear uh, so that the participants can understand the language. Avoid jargon. And um, it also becomes invalid if the researcher's organization was not specifically named, subjects were not informed about their rights to withdraw, and so on. So these things need to be uh, mentioned if you are to obtain an explicit consent. And um, um, explicit consent statements should also specifically refer to the particular data set that is to be processed and the precise purpose of processing, including any automated decision-making, should be there. And it should identify any risk or any implications that might arise for the data subject as a result of the data processing. And um, it should also provide any other relevant or specific information that might influence the decision of a data subject to give or not to give their consent. So these, these things need to be considered if you are to obtain an explicit consent. So this and couple of the following slides are the screenshots of a very nice checklist from University of Dublin in, uh, in order to assess if your explicit consent form is in line with the <clears throat> GDPR and um, health related regulations. So you can see here, I have added a link on the on this slide for you to have a look uh, la later on uh, for this checklist. So you, you can see that um, it's, a, it's quite a nice checklist. So this first section addresses, has the consent been freely given? Have you informed the data subject that they have the option to withdraw their consent at any time if they 
wish to do that and then there, there are some un underneath there are some conditions that you can check or you can add to your explicit consent form then here is the consent specific is the consent informed the consent must be unambiguous so a very nice checklist here uh, around automated decision making then international data transfer some guidance um, added here uh, sign post posted to the gdpr on international data transfer so and then i have added a link from the ehra health research authority guidance on obtaining consent if you if you are interested in health re related uh, research so yeah, you can, it's it's beyond the scope of this workshop to go into details of all this. So I, I just signposted these, they, these could be useful for you. <clears throat> so apart uh, from <clears throat> being, uh, sorry, my, I, my throat is getting dry these days. So apart from being good scientific practice in some countries gaining informed consent is mandated by the law as i mentioned in the uk um, there is no mandatory requirement excuse me uh, that you obtain consent uh, as a legal base but rather public task is being used here but in some countries you can see here that um, Obtaining consent is a mandatory requirement. Almost all countries, Czech Republic, Croatia, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, yeah, and so on, they, 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 they do mandate. But there are some extra conditions as well. So the this section is about um, how to seek consent it includes formats to obtain consent documentation methods and some information on record keeping so <clears throat> consent can be obtained written or oral um, the format of the consent depends on the kind of research however it is important that whatever format you use either written or verbal, it should be documented. You need to document how it has been gained, what information has been provided to the participants and what they have agreed to. Um, so as I said, consent can be written or verbal. Both formats have uh, pros and cons. For example, written consent has more solid legal ground. For example, participants have agreed to disclose confidential information. And this is the form that is usually required by ethics committees. And most of all, it offers more protection for researchers as they have written evidence of consent. However, it cannot be used in some instances, um, such as in illegal activities and so on, um, or with children. Um, on the other hand, verbal consents are best if recorded, but sometimes it is hard to make all issues clear verbally and most of all, it can pose greater risk for researchers uh, in regards to adequately proving participant consent and it may scare people from participating as well and um, they may think that they cannot withdraw their consent. So both both form, formats have their pros and cons. And as I said, it depends on the context of their of the research. Typically, written consent documentation includes an information sheet and a consent form signed by the participant. And um, this division allows the background information to be as detailed as necessary while keeping the signature form short and concise. So an information sheet should cover the following. I, I, I'm sure you are aware of um, this, but um, just to give you an idea that it should cover the purpose of the research, what what is involved in participating, participating and um, benefits and risks of participating, 
procedures for withdrawal future uses of data such as storage, publishing, archiving, and details of the research such as funding source, sponsoring institution, name of project, contact details of researchers, and how to file a complaint. So these are some important uh, considerations that needs to be in there. And uh, researchers need to make sure that the consent form should use simple language and should allow the participants to clearly respond to points such as they have read and understood information about the project. They have been given the opportunity to ask the questions uh, and they voluntarily agrees to participate in the project and they understand that they can withdraw at any time without giving reasons and without penalty. And um, most importantly, future uses, for example, publications, sharing, archiving should be there, signatures and dates of signing for the participant and the researcher should be there. And uh, if you are collecting personal information, then best practice is to provide information about how personal information will be processed, stored, and for how long. Procedures for maintaining confidentiality should be there, whether you are using real names or not, if um, data will be anonymized, if you are anonymizing it, how you are going to anonymize it. It should also state procedures for ensuring ethical use of data, especially in the context of archiving and reuse. And um, if the data protection regulation applies, then further information needs to be provided in the consent form, such as the contact details of the data controller. Um, data controller is the entity that determines the reason for processing personal data and it could be a data protection officer or are you at your organization or a researcher consent form should also state who will receive or have access to the personal data and it should also have a clear statement on the rights of the participants because participants can request to access their data they may ask for corrections or even removal of their personal data, and these need to be communicated to the participants. But you may use some of the uh, some of these in the information sheet and some in the consent form. So uh, I have added a UK Data Service model consent form template on the resources slide. Uh, that covers all of the these things, and you can have a look at this. So different methods can be used to obtain consent, and ICO has recommended um, these methods. For example, signing a consent statement on a paper form, ticking an opt-in box on paper or even electronically, or... Um, clicking an opt-in button or link online, selecting from equally prominent yes-no options, choosing technical settings or preference da dashboard settings, or um, even responding to an email requesting consent is okay. And answering yes to a clear oral consent request is fine as well. And you can see that all of these methods fulfill the conditions that are required for the consent, which um, emphasizes on getting a clear affirmative action and uh, where it cannot be inferred from silence, pre tick boxes or inactivity. So using these methods uh, addresses those, those co considerations or concerns. So just to give you a break from listening to all this dry content. If you could please go to the Mentimeter using this code or QR code. <clears throat> so here is the code for you on the screen. <clears throat> so this is the last Mentimeter activity. I should have said in the beginning that you can leave the Mentimeter um, as it is for the next activity which comes later on. 
in the session, but yeah, that that's the last one, I think. Sorry. So the first question is, it's, it's just um, a reflection. If you have ever used the consent forms for your research or are you planning to use, which format of the consent you have used in your research? So that's interesting to see. For my research during my PhD, I have used the paper form, written one. So email, oral and recorded, that's interesting. Digital, electronic. There is one comment, not worked with humans. All right, okay. Tick boxes, digital on survey. So it's a mix. That's that's really interesting, fantastic that um, you, uh, people, uh, researchers are using different forms, uh, formats to obtain consent. Different methods are being used to obtain consents consent that's that's interesting fantastic thank you very much so word document great so someone has not used yet that that's fine maybe you have more information if you are to use it in futures so document signature recorded audio yeah, I, so the diverse ways to obtain consent. That's that's fantastic. Thank you very much. So if you remember your consent forms, I, I don't remember what I have done during my PhD. But in case, if you remember, have you given the opportunity to ask questions? That's great. <clears throat> So someone is not sure, maybe you don't remember. Some have mentioned no. So yeah, well, majority of you have given the opportunity. So that's, that's great. Because it's an ethical obligation as well as um, even if you are not using consent as a lawful base, but it's uh, ethically, it is right to give the participants an opportunity to ask questions in case there isn't anything which is not clear to them. So that's great majority of you have given and some have said no, so there may be some reason. Um, so another one. <clears throat> Did your consent form inform the participants about future uses of data such as publications, data archiving? So this is in the context of, uh, especially if you plan to share your data, because these days, if you're if you're an ESRC grant, grant holder, ESRC, uh, I think mandates um, depositing your data uh, within the three months of uh, <clears throat> your grant uh, when it's finished. And some of the journals these days also uh, ask for data to be deposited. So future uses of data should be there uh, in the consent forms. It's it's It may be relatively not new, I would say, because it is there uh, some for some years, but um, yeah, funders and journals, they, they, they have uh, asked now uh, started asking for data to be deposited. So the consent form, should inform the participants. Um, I have seen uh, many consent forms from the researchers in my current role, and they do mention about the publications sometimes, and but they, they do not mention anything about data archiving. So then they, there is a problem. If participants are not informed, then we, we are not able to um, 
deposit that data and we always advise to seek retrospective consent which is not feasible in um i think every case so this is an important uh, bit to go into the consent form if you plan to share your data thank you very much so i think that's the last one <clears throat> Are you collecting personal information? And if so, have you informed the part participants how it will be processed, stored, and for how long? So that's that's great. Um, majority of you are collecting or have collected and you have informed. Some of you have not. Maybe you have not collected personal information. Maybe you are not planning to deposit your data so there, there could be any reason that's that's fine thank you very much <clears throat> yeah i think that that's it thank you that's fantastic going back to our talk so this section I think this is the last one. It is on uh, when to seek consent. Uh, obtaining consent for participation in research or future uses such as publications or sharing uh, of data can be a one-off occurrence or it could be an ongoing process. Both approaches have advantages and disadvantages. Um, one of consent is uh, used for taking part in the research project only once, uh, which is evident from its um, name. And um, it is simple and it, it is a least hassle to participants as well as researchers, but there are disadvantages such as uh, sometimes research outputs are not known in advance and the participants will not know about all the information they will be contributing to. And um, on the other hand, process consent is requested continu continuously throughout the research project and it ensures active consent, but it may not get all the consent needed before losing contact or it can be repetitive for participants uh, or they may get annoyed. So disadvantages and advantages with both of them and it also depends on the context of your research, whether you are using one of or you need process consent, consent but um, both are being used. There are situations where special considerations are needed when seeking consent, and it is beyond the scope of this session to go through each of these. However, you can find detailed information on these on our website, the link is at the bottom of the slide for you to have a look. So sometimes researchers are faced with the challenges when sharing or archiving data, especially if the data contains personal information and cannot be anonymized. And at the time of data collection, they do not consider obtaining consent for future uses of data, specifically archiving and sharing, which is mostly the case. In that case, they may consider retrospective consent, as I mentioned earlier. However, if participants cannot be traced, depositing the data in a repository is really, really problematic. And sometimes um, it needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis to identify whether it is appropriate to share it or possibly present it to the ethics board for review and decision. And um, the assessment is made based on the risk, harm, benefits, disclosive nature of the data, and so on. Um, in addition, sometimes researchers are faced with the challenges when participants ask to withdraw from the research. This is challenging, especially if the data has been collected or archived for future use. And again, this needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, but it is best if researchers consider this in advance and provide information about this in the information sheet and consent forms. And um, sometimes there may not be a problem 
And as the personal data is not shared or it may be anonymized, but sometimes in qualitative studies where there are very less participants, it could be damaging. Data can lose its value. So researchers can consider for dealing with participants uh, wishing to withdraw. Uh, they could seek a meeting to explain to the participant the cost of this to the project, or they could discuss whether some of the data could be kept for Example, if data can be anonymized, they can explain this to them. And yeah, it depends uh, on the on the researcher and the part participant. And um, th there are circumstances where no form of consent can be obtained. These situations are exceptional and we again need case by case review and clear arguments to satisfy the requirements of ethic review boards and um, there can be varied reasons why consent is not possible. For example, limited capacity may prevent a person from being fully informed or um, sometimes data may have already been collected for another purpose that did not require consent such as government administrative data. And um, consent may not be technically feasible in some very large scale projects. So you can get detailed information regarding this on our website. So I have added a link here. Um, in addition, participants' perception, or if the sample comprises of children and vulnerable people, patients' poor awareness of their rights, failure to provide adequate information, or um, absence of consideration of participants, educational level or cultural background, time constraints, use of unclear language, all of these could be challenging for the researcher. So you need to consider uh, this from the very onset of your research. And um, in terms of data sharing, if not communicated clearly, participants are skeptical of confidentiality issues as well. So always try to think carefully and always uh, be open to discussions. So now I'll show you some real examples from the consent forms that depositors have used to deposit their data with us and um, uh, screenshots of our uh, consent form templates in this section. So um, before I show you the wording, um, just to give you an idea that the information can be broken down into three key areas. Um, in the information sheet or in the consent forms, you can use these three key areas to provide information to the participants. So the first one is uh, around information relating to participation in the research, how the information collected will be used by the researcher and the information about future uses by the researcher or by other researchers if data would be shared. So these are the three broader uh, sections that, that should be in there. So this is an extract uh, screenshot of the UK Data Service uh, model consent form template. So this section is about taking part in the study. I'll, I'll let you read it quickly. So this is uh, the first section. So it, uh, you can see that uh, it has captured several aspects such as participants have read and understand the information around voluntary participation, withdrawal, and it also explains what they have to do, how information is being collected, or if there are any potential risks. So it's all about taking part in the study. This section is about the uses of information or data that is being collected. And it also addresses the confidentiality aspect, aspect by asking what can or cannot be shared. And third area that needs to be in there is around future use and reuse of the information by others. So all of the information where the data will be deposited in which form, whether it is anonymized or if available under restrictions. So yeah, 
this way you 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 did address all the three broader key areas that should be in the um in the consent forms along with the information sheet so you you can divide the content and put some content in information sheet and some in consent form but th these are the three key areas that needs to be in there so these are some of the example extracts that have been used in real researches. I let you read this. So the first extract focuses on two things, future uses of data and also all forms of data formats, for, uh, audio recordings, transcripts, photographs are mentioned separately. And this addresses the condition of granularity, which is, I think, great. They have asked for each format separately. And in the second example, participants are being informed about the future uses such as um, a report, content of a website, archiving, reuse by other researchers. And here you can see that they have also been told that they may be uh, contacted again if their personal data or a quote or photograph will be used, which shows an active consent or process consent, So, which is great. And here again, providing information regarding archiving, who will have access to the data and on what conditions um, also states their reuse purposes as well. So both, both of these extracts, extracts show how confidentiality can be maintained, how personal data will be stored, who can have access to it, and on what conditions and where it will be stored. So that's a nice example as well. So here is an example from Health Research Authority, and it is a very nice example um, about um, a blood donation study. I'm not sure how many of you are health researchers, but this may give you an idea how to present information to the participants. Here, they have combined information sheet and consent form in one document. And um, on the title page, they have added consent statements addressing most of the conditions we have gone through. And then followed by this, um, they have uh, included the information, why is the study needed? Why have I been invited and am I eligible? And what does taking part in the research involve? Do they have to take part? What should they do if um, they want to take part? And uh, what happens during the visit? What happens to their blood samples? Or you can say what happens to the data that is being collected? What happens immediately after they enrolled? What happens next? It's the timeline or the next steps. Uh, information about benefits, risk, and how to withdraw, and how their information is being used, and can they know the results? So you 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 can consider providing information if are they able to receive the findings. So who is organizing and funding? Who has approved the study? And um, outcomes of the research findings and what happens if something goes wrong and how to complain. So a very comprehensive consent form plus information sheet. So there is a link to this uh, on the resource slide at the end. So I think that's it. So there, there is an activity uh, where you can 
at assess consent form statements. These are real consent form statements that we came across um, uh, from researchers who deposited data with us. If you go to the Padlet, please, Gail. Thank you, Gail. Um, yeah, Gail has added a link to the Padlet. for this activity. So I have added five statements on the Padlet and it's anonymous. If you would like to start from the statement one, Do you have any suggestions for alternative wording or if you could see that uh, these are inappropriate or these should not be used or any, any thoughts on these? I'll give you 10 minutes for this and then we will go through it. Um, somebody in the chat ask, all right, thank you, Gail, for answering that. There, there is a QR code um, on your screen. I think it's on the top corner. You can scan it from your mobile. There are quite a lot of responses already there. So I think 10 minutes would be a lot. I'll give um, two more minutes and then we'll go through each of these. So there are 23 responses for the first one and then it dropped to 13. <laughs> okay, let's you can keep on writing for the later on, um, for the second, third, fourth, fifth, if you are still writing, let's start with the first statement um, where we have seen this sort of statement in the consent form several times when any researcher comes to us uh, to deposit their data for uh, future use that any information I give will be used for research only and will not be used for any other purpose. And as most of you have mentioned that um, what research is, it's unclear and uh, they need to mention the name of the research, very non-specific, vague, and um, they need to define the information, which information they are referring to exactly. That's that's brilliant. And it requires clarity. It's vague, not specific. Yeah, and then there is a comment that it um, research other than the, it nice to 
make it clear that the research other than the project they are consenting to and whether it will be anonymous or not. And yeah, so it is definitely vague. And on top of that, if the researcher is planning to share data, then statements like this can prohibit the reuse of data for teaching and le le uh, learning purposes. And as you said, what information do we mean specifically here? Statements such as for research, teaching and learning purposes are better in permitting other uses of the data. So yeah, that's quite certain that this is a very unclear, unspecific, very weak statement. And we, we cannot say that um, this is uh, this should be okay for informing the participants. So that's vague. Coming to the second one, I agree to participate in this study and to have any audio and visual data used for analysis, reports, and presentations. So the problem here is, um, again, it's non-specific again, for how long period of time should be their anonymity Yes, that's, that's right. And should split audio and visual and outputs. Yes, that's that's what we have just seen uh, around the granularity that um, the formats should be mentioned separately. Yes. So yeah, that's too big. Thank you very much um, for your responses. That's right. So depending on the project, it may be more appropriate to break this down into subcategories of offering the participants more choice, such as to have their data used for analysis and reports, but not in presentations. This can also be broken down into uh, different statements. And this statement also does not explain whether the data will directly identify them or be a direct quotation from them. So it is uh, therefore important for the information sheet to provide more context and guidance here. So um, you are right. Thank you for your responses. That's brilliant. And the third one is um, in accordance with the requirement of our university's research ethics committee, data from this project will be destroyed after funding concludes. So this is very problematic. So Someone has written, when will the funding conclude? Yes, uh, you need to provide all the information, whether uh, if it is too detailed, you could put it in the information sheet and uh, keep the consent form concise. So yeah, it is again, very uh, problematic. And then there are comments. This is contrary to open and fair principles and may also go against funder of publisher requirements. That's right, that's what I was saying. Um, they, they also need to explain what data, do we mean data which will be contained in the research data set? What about funders requirement, as you said, to deposit and share data? Here again, it is about providing clarity to participants around which data will be deleted specifically and which will be archived. At the moment, it is just precluding data sharing that it all the data will be destroyed. So uh, I'm sure they are referring to the personal data, but they, they need to specify this here. So the number four is, I understand that only the research team will have access to the data I will provide. <clears throat> Again, that's problematic. Um, especially if you are to share your data and thank you for your responses. Yes, the, all of you are right. What you have uh, commented on or suggested. So again, what about data sharing or archiving? Again, it is important to clarify with participants what data will be shared and who will have access to this data and what information will only be seen by the research team because Otherwise, at the moment, it is precluding data sharing and it is problematic if you if you are to share the, the data. Then um, the last statement is, I understand that the information provided will be used in a report and other publications likely to be read by the parents of young children and by teachers and others working on educational issues. So 
Yeah, the first comment is, will the information be fully anonymous? Yes, the, so these are the issues. What message is this statement trying to convey? Can we provide more clarity about specifically what information will be used in the report? Do we mean personal details, direct quotes, or, and so on? So yeah, thank you very much for your responses. And let's get back, that's brilliant. Get back to the slides. Thank you for engaging. So uh, the take a, take away message is do not collect personal data if it is not essential, because if um, the data do not have personal data, then data regulations do not apply. And indicate clearly in a consent form where the participant consent is being asked for processing their personal data and where it is being asked for taking part in the research and also where you have asked for um, the consent to deposit their data for future reuse and keep consent forms under constant review and always, always indicate the future uses of data especially if you plan to share it. So that's that's really important. And then there, there is a mini module on our website, uh, which is ethical consent and data sharing. It's, it's uh, a very simple one, but just to give you an idea, if you are to teach someone uh, about the role of consent, uh, here is the module. And it's quite interactive, very simple one. It's a mini module, but I'll just show you. It will explain the role of consent as an ethical obligation, as well as the uh, legal um, obligation, if you are to use it. And then here you can see that the ethical reasons, then lawful basis, a very, very brief and quick introduction if you need to explain to someone. So documenting, then taking part section involved, use of information in the study and future use and reuse of information. Then check your knowledge. Then there are some quick questions where they can check their knowledge. So yeah, it's, it's, it's handy in case you are interested Thing, interested in that, I thought to share it here. <clears throat> These are the resources I have been referring to. The, 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 they are signposted here. You can have a look at these. And also, before I go to the question, here's my email address. If you have any project related specific question, uh, I'm happy to help. You can always email me uh, about that.